if taken raw. Well, there's your key. The half truth is black pepper is severe to take. Don't take it because it will cause irritation. But the truth is it will only cause irritation when it is cooked. When the black pepper has changed from organic, live, that can be assimilated and used to good and switched over to dead, inorganic, that is a killer and worthless. Now there is your difference. And so this goes with all of your condiments. Remember this, all of your condiments, when they are cooked to a point or heated to where they have become inorganic, you're in trouble. Black pepper, the best way to use it is when it is coarsely ground. Grind your pepper and uh, do it fresh. And the reason we do it fresh is because we know that it's okay to use now. If you're using black pepper that you have purchased from the store, be sure you know the store and know their turnover and know their qualifications. Because the reason we have so much black pepper that is okay is because it's got the formaldehyde in. And formaldehyde, if we use enough of it, of course, we won't have to any, have any when we die, but uh, I, I'd rather wait and <coughs> not have it as long with our meals. But black pepper will not keep when it's been crushed. But the peppercorn, your little peppercorn, hard, it is perfect. It's got its own shell around it, and it's good until it is broken. So we use our pepper grinder and grind it fresh right now. Is this from The only black pepper I know of is the one that's imported. Now, I, I don't know of our locals. I don't know. Does anybody? Well, uh, that's why the pepper is as expensive as it is, is because we have to bring it in. Let me talk on one more of the great stimulants. You notice we talked about peppermint being a stimulant. Now, the peppermint is easy to take. If we used a stimulant like with tincture of lobelia and gave the patient a new patient that wasn't an herbalist cayenne, it'll turn them off awfully fast, awfully fast, where the peppermint won't. And so here, conditions alter cases. Our next one is cloves. The cloves is, is something that, yeah, I generally carry some cloves around because I chomp on them. They're, uh, they're good. You have to learn to suck on them first because if you bite them, they'll bite you back. <laughs> but, but after a period of time, you can get so that they're, they're very, very tasty. I got in the habit while I was doing iridology uh, over the country, I would read so many hundreds and hundreds of eyes. And of course, I'm this far from the individual and after I've had a salad with garlic and onion in, <laughs> or foods that, uh, that left their traces, uh, I was always so embarrassed. And I didn't know what to do, so I would take mints and uh, have uh, sweet mints and things like this, and, and uh, it kind of covered my breath. But you know, I got sores in my mouth, and I could only do it so long, and I, I, I couldn't take the toxicity. And so, one day I, I heard the statement, cloves by Joe, it takes your breath away. And I thought, hey, I wonder. So I started chopping on cloves. And I remember up in Canada, I'd just finished a, the most delicious <laughs> salad I'd had for years. Oh, it was loaded with garlic, and it had onions in it, and, and oh, it was something. And I just drooled over it. And I thought, holy cow, I uh, wonder what my first patient will do, fall over dead, I guess. And so I started working some clothes over. And 
I got up and they came in and I took my light and my glass and, and said, hmm, what's that delicious fragrance? <laughs> oh, I said, that's cloves. I'm using. I didn't say that was a cover-up. I just said, that's cloves. Well, this is how good cloves can be. But now let me tell you a formula for our nausea. This is an anti-nausea formula that there has been nothing that I've ever found that's equal to it. And it's for a morning sickness, it's for air sickness, car sickness, boat sickness. This is great. We take equal parts of clothes, of equal parts of clothes, of cinnamon, of allspice, of of turkey rhubarb. Have you got those? Mm -hmm. Now, I give you four there. We only actually need, uh, we, we can do without the allspice, or we can substitute the allspice and the cinnamon. We can alternate those. But they'll do the job if you do all of them. Now, we take one ounce of these combined. And we make with these a concoction. And what is a concoction different from a, an infusion? The concoction we simmer. We try not to boil any concoction unless it is very hard roots or very hard bark. Preferably, instead of boiling these, we will pre-soak. And we will soak for four to six hours any of these things. But I'm just throwing this in. Yes. Decoction. 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 What did I say? Concoction. Well, it is a concoction. I'm glad you corrected me on that. That'll go down in history. We, we, this is one ounce to a pint. One pint, and that is distilled water. And you will find that with steam distilled water, you will take, you will get 30 to 35 percent more potency out of your herbs than you will with standard tap water. So use steam distilled water, one pint. Now you simmer it for five minutes, give or take. But five minutes is about the right length of time. But it must be done with the lid on it. After you have done this, we now, yes. Oh, we now take one ounce of spearmint leaves. Now we've been talking about peppermint as a stimulant. I'm talking about now spearmint. Spearmint one ounce, and we pour over the ounce of spearmint leaves the pint of decoction. Now what we are doing, we are taking the pint of decoction and pouring it over the spearmint leaves and covering it, and now that makes an infusion. Now an infusion can be anything where a liquid has been poured over, whether it's cold, hot, <coughs> it doesn't matter what the temperature is. That's an infusion. But now we've taken the decoction and made it an infusion. Now, if you can understand what I've said, uh, you have been sleeping. Okay? This particular formula that I've just given you, after it has been strained and sweetened with honey, is delicious. This is very delicious. And when you have nausea, a tablespoonful or a teaspoonful, and most anything like this, will work out fine. But we have had cases, we had a case, I'll never forget, the woman had laid in bed for nine months 
and then had her baby. Because every time she would raise her head, she would go green around the gills. Nine months. And you know, she had that baby, and this woman got hungry to hold another baby. So you think they'd learn the lesson, crazy people. <laughs> but she wanted another baby. And after going through nine months of this, she did it again. And when the case was given to us and we went on this house call, she had already gone over three months in bed. But she wanted to get up so badly. And we, they had tried everything they'd known. And so we got called in. And this, is what, this formula here is what we used. And she used it. And whenever she got a little nauseated, she would take some of it. And she got over it. And she spent the rest of her time up and doing her housework. Do you think that would work for motion sickness, like in the car? Yes, definitely. We, we have had many cases using it in motion sickness. Uh, a problem on comfrey, you know, this is one that is planted by many to harvest roots. And uh, you plow down about one foot and go right on through. And it leaves all the small rootlets and you harvest the roots that you take up, and you still got a full. Would you do that in the fall? This is, now, wait a minute. I'm not right positive on that. It seems to me that the harvest time is, is after the leaves have started to fall. You see, the power has got to go out of the leaf back into the root. So it'd be in the fall. Plow it down and then you dig the, dig the roots up. You, know. you take the roots up and the roots are cut into one inch and two inch lengths. And uh, these are, um, are ready to use as soon as you want to plant them. But the beautiful part about it is down under where this has been dug up, you've got the little rootlets and uh, they come right back up and you've got a full crop. So uh, these can be harvested regularly every, uh, I can't remember what it is, every two or three years or something of this type. And, uh, and in the meantime, you're getting all of the foliage. So you've got a full package there. The comfrey will eventually be used more and more by cattle users. A cow cannot start right off on comfrey leaves. They have to uh, put it in with hay or something else and give it to them gradually. There are a few animals that can take it straight, but not too many. They're almost human. I mean, we have a, a principle of a person could live on comfrey. It runs well over 20% protein. Comfrey is a powerful food. It's one of the greatest foods that we have got. And uh, it's going to come more and more into prominence as time comes along. There is only one thing that will uh, exceed this that I can speak of right now. And uh, we haven't got the facilities for it. We haven't, got, uh, we haven't had the monies to put into it. But this is chlorella, chlorella. We took our first chlorella samples from, uh, from China and imported them. And this is, this is a, a cell type production. You grow it in water. And we harvest every seven days with a special machine. And uh, it multiplies just as rapidly as you harvest it. And then you dehydrate your um, chlorella that you've taken off. And it can be put into capsules or tablets. Or the, the astronauts have used it. And it has proven very, very successful. But one thing I do like about uh, chlorella, and one day we'll come into this production. And uh, so don't forget it. With chlorilla, I had some associates that uh, were in the turkey business years ago, 
and uh, their turkeys would grow the average of uh, uh, 12, 14 pounds, 16 pounds, and some of them would get up around the 30 pound mark. But uh, when they were fed chlorilla instead of the regular poultry feed, they would get up to 70, 75, and 80 pounds. But there were no uh, C grade, there were no B grade, everything was A grade. The animals that were grown, some of our associates grew some um, hogs. And uh, they, they got such tremendous growth from these that uh, it was almost unbelievable the size that they got. But it was all grade A, everything was grade A and far superior merchandise by far. No, chlorilla will come to the light. I don't know, this is the first of my lectures I've ever talked about chlorilla. I, I was hired many, many years ago by a Russian scientist. He couldn't speak English and so I would uh, precede him and lecture on chlorilla and uh, uh, he, he could get the messages to me and then I would put them out to the public. Well, we, we started growing it and the things that we have seen, the animals, they do not have pituitary pineal control always and oft times we'll find cattle and uh, rabbits and various things that will grow three, four times their average size. But it is all grade A. Um, this is interesting. We have found that humans do very well on it. So one day we'll tell you more about chlorella. We'll uh, maybe let you visit a ranch someday. Oh, right. Is it available now? No, I'll tell you. I'm very. Is there some? Yeah. Where? Have you heard of a spirulina plankton by Dr. Christopher Hills? I just got an article on that and didn't have time to read it the other day. Is, is that chlorilla? No, where's that? <laughs> At where? A better source actually than chlorilla. Yeah. Oh, I have some. A better algae type? Yeah. What do you feed it? We had to feed... We had to feed it uh, bloods and things these, when I was working with it years ago. But chlorella is bacteria. No, this is an algae. No, it's an algae. It's but it, it, it eats bacteria. It does eat bacteria? Mm -hmm. And it's daylight, too. there's sunlight to become green. Otherwise, it's, it's, light, it's transparent. Well, well, I'm glad to hear it's getting active. Oh, yes, it runs around 65 to 80. We've had some cases of up to 80% protein, and it is assimilatable. There is no waste. Oh, I'm, I'm feeding you on something here that you'll be drooling for. Well, I, I hope so, so that you'll do more research on it. I hope you'll get at it, because look, we are coming into times of drought. All right, this grows in water, and so we'll, we'll have to learn how to keep our waters purified and know the areas where we can depend on water and grow our chlorilla. It uh, goes on and on and on. It doesn't die if you take care of it properly. I don't know how we got on this subject, but it's interesting. Um, I have a lot of it written if you'd like to try it. And I also have chemical analysis that I'll give to you. Sometimes. This sounds interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a number of years since I've had a chance to work with chlorilla. I've been so busy on other things. and. And the Russian gentleman, I heard the other day, is, he's got uh, around the 100-year mark, and he's uh, still out uh, uh, trying to get things going. But what actually spoiled it in the state of Utah, and I'm sorry to say it, some uh, naturopathic friends of mine got on the bandwagon, and uh, instead of going through as was taught and prescribed, going up gradually, they made a stock promotion of it. And uh, uh, the two nature paths had to move out of town. They're looking for them. And, I, and, and these are things that make things unsavory. And I don't like it. But uh, the procedure of learning the principles of chlorilla is good. And it's accurate. 
So get into it. This is a thing of the future. And what are we doing now? Herbs are a thing of the present, but also a thing of the future. Because we have now, instead of 350 odd herbs as known at the times of Hippocrates, we have 3,500,000 herbs to work with. And this makes things more interesting as we go along. We're going into the tonic herbs now. And the tonic herbs are those that tone up the body, uh, tone it up in uh, various areas. So let's go into some of these. Uh, barberry is one. And barberry is one of the great uh, tonic herbs. A tonic herb is something that tones up. We used to, years ago, on the herb shop, I used to have a label called uh, the tonics. And it would be the liver tonic, the heart tonic, the bowel tonic. And so I got notice from the FDA that I had to appear in Denver, Colorado on trial. And I didn't know what for. And when I got there, they said that I was in trouble. And I said, for what? And uh, they said, in labeling. What's wrong with my labeling? Well, you're using the word uh, tonic. And that means that something can be toned up. Well, I says it, it, and they said, don't say it or we'll make you discontinue your business completely. You cannot use the word tonic because this is falsification. Made me sick of the stomach, but nevertheless, I said, can I use another word instead of tonic? Why, yes. Uh, I mean, another word to use? And I said, yes, let's use the word palliative. They looked up the word palliative, and they found out it was a, a Mickey Mouse word that meant yes or no. It could or could not be. In other words, it, uh, it wasn't something positive at all. And they said, yes, you can use the word palliative. And so we had our, our labels reissued, and we had liver palliative, heart palliative, bowel palliative, nerve palliative, and you know, uh, the sales just kept going on. Two years passed. I was notified by the FDA I was to appear in Denver, Colorado on trial. Well, at my own expense, I got over there. And when I got to Denver, I said, what's the matter this time? Labeling. Well, what's wrong with labeling? Because you told me I could use the word palliative and that was the only thing you said was wrong, and I've been using the word palliative. Well, he said, that's the trouble. The word palliative doesn't mean anything, but you're selling so much product that people think that the word palliative means tonic, and you cannot use it anymore. Well, folks, you know that kind of sticks in your craw when you get this thing often enough over as many years as I have, and I'm about ready to ask them to uh, find a new home <laughs> or something. But <laughs> we're now on tonics. <laughs> now don't tell me they don't tone something up or I'll walk out of here. I've had it. All right, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Barberry. Barberry is one of our bitter tonics. Now this is a peculiar term that's been used bitter tonics, and this has been used for quite a few years, especially by the medicine men and the traveling snake uh, oil users and so forth and so on. They would say, we have the bitter tonic. Well, any tonic, so help me, isn't vanilla flavored. <laughs> it isn't sweet. It's bitter. And that is double usage of a ridiculous term. Bitter tonic. Barberry. I ask any of you to have a cup of barberry tea and tell me it isn't bitter. And if you do, we'll get you a job with Barnum and Bailey. <laughs> because here is one person without the taste buds. That is bitter. You know, an interesting thing about barberry tea, it has been given to children for many, many years who don't eat. 
who are never hungry, who has no appetite, are going downhill and getting thinner and thinner. And we give them barberry. And it is a tonic. I'm brave enough to say these words right now. Is there anybody from yet? Ne nevertheless. Uh, tonic. It tones up the system, the liver, and the gallbladder. And we have seen children who wouldn't uh, eat before, even under pressure, they would turn the food away, that after they've had the barberry tonic, they would eat you out of a house and home. It's great. So uh, these are just to tone up the body. Now the barberry will also tone up other parts of the body. We speak of barberry, the barbaris vulgaris, but remember the, the sister plants are called Rocky Mountain grape and uh, Oregon grape. These two are similar to your barberry, and you find them up in the northwest area more prominently sometimes, and you will find your barberry. Here we have uh, another herb, and that herb is called golden seal. A golden seal is a terrific herb if it is used properly, but it is like the heat that heats the house. It'll either heat it or burn it down. That heat has to be kept in control. Now they kept it in control years back with a product called Viavi. How many know the product Viavi? Any of any? Hold your hands up. Not a soul. I guess I'm older than I thought. <laughs> Viavi used to be a uh, dead runner for, uh, for what was her name, Perkins? Uh, Lydia. Lydia, sure. Lydia Perkins. Pinkham. 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 Lydia Pinkham's Pleasant Pellets. Yeah, that's it. Anyhow, Lydia Pinkham, well, Viavi ran uh, an awfully close race because they used a, a, a good quality and quantity of golden seal in it. But they used other herbs, and it was good for female problems. Lydia Pick Pinkham, Lydia Pinkham, yeah. Uh, she used to have a name in every home, practically. But the is not being used much anymore. There are a few people once in a while that handle it, but it's not too often. But it did so much good for so many people. When it comes to the system of golden seal, this is an herb that should never be gathered until, never harvested until it's at least six or seven years old. And there are people who try to speed up the growth. They try to over fertilize and they do many things to try and make the golden seal come up earlier so they can get a bigger harvest of it. In fact, golden seal and ginseng were two of the herbs that had been used by the old timers to uh, uh, make money on because they were very good for medicinal uses. Our church leader, Joseph Smith, his parents harvested golden seal and ginseng from up in the New York area because it was very, very bountiful up there. And uh, that's how they made part of their living. Now, golden seal is one of the great herbs of all times. It is an antibiotic, superb. Your golden seal will cut infection. It will do so many things. But we make a mistake and we forget that as potent as it is, it can be a little on the uh, dangerous side. Golden seal can be used with no harm at all to get rid of our infections and things of this type, but if we continue to use it in large quantities, we can be in trouble because the golden seal will eventually eat the vitamin B out of the body and we will lose our animation. We lose all our desire to do things. We, we've had cases where 
They had no, absolutely no desire to even get up in the morning, no desire to go to work, no one, they didn't want to do anything. I remember reading a lady's eyes once. She'd come in and I looked into her eyes and I saw the animation area at 12 was black. And you know, now it could have been from not having the electrical energy going through the body that I spoke of, not uh, keeping her shoes off or wearing the wrong kind of clothes. But every once in a while in readings, and you'll all run into it if you haven't already, and crazy things come to you. But uh, I, I looked at her eyes and I said, my word, ma'am, how much golden seal do you use? It just came out of the air. She said, well, golden seal? Oh, well, she said, I got some on bargain. I got it cheaper by almost one half of what I've been buying it, and so I'm taking the tablespoon or more a day. Well, what had it done? It had eaten the vitamin B out of her body. Right, it's, it's like the fire. It'll cook your meal or it'll burn your house down. It was burning her house down now, yes. I've heard of um, about using golden seal for not using it in, with the hypoglycemia. Do you know anything about that? There are a number of formulas that are made up for using golden seal in hypoglycemia. Of course, my belief is not to work on hypoglycemia any more than the diabetes. Our principle is to go to the cause and rebuild the pancreas. And in the pancreas, we don't need the golden seal. So what you're actually doing is furnishing an artificial. Though it is a natural herb, it would be artificial in the fact that you're supplying insulin in the form of golden seal. And they oft times will use too much of it. And when they use too much, the vitamin B is eaten out again and animation is lost. Well, on this particular case, we informed the lady to discontinue the golden seal until we had gotten rid of the uh, animation dark lifeline. And when that was gone, then she wanted some golden seal to cut down. And what do we recommend? A number five capsule maximum, two times a week. Now, if you know what a number five capsule is, my fingers are a little too big and sloppy to put them together. I have to get people with more delicate hands than I've got to put number fives together. So that's about what you would use for a week. But golden seal is tremendous. Now, we go into ginseng. Ginseng is an herb of herbs. It is one of the patriarchal herbs. This also must be harvested after its seventh year. Now, by osmosis, it is taken from the dust of the earth, the many minerals. And one thing about being a patriarchal herb, they have the ability of taking not two minerals or three minerals or a few, but they take many of the minerals and gather them in, and they have the ability of storing them. Now, the patriarchal herb is more than an annual. It's a perennial or one that lasts for a long, long time and grows year after year after year. So it would be a tree or something of this type. So your uh, ginseng is a patriarchal. And on the ginseng root, as you look at it, each year it will come out into a new area on the root. It will come out uh, through the ground, but you'll go down and it has got a new year bud on it. This year bud, when you've learned to read them, will be three year, five year, seven year. And I have on my shelves in my library at home a ginseng root that has on it 83 year knobs. 83. There are some that'll go well over the 100 year mark. They have been alive this long. And during that entire time, they are collectors. They are patriarchs of knowledge, of knowledge in the way of minerals and they store them up. So when you're taking ginseng, let me once again say this is a marvelous tonic. Terrific. But don't overdo it. Don't ever overdo it. Start with your ginseng very small. Yes. Uh, a medicine man in San Diego that I'm studying under told us about how when he was in the Indian tribe, they'd go out at night and 
and they would see that this was uh, glowing and then they'd mark the spot and come back the next day and pick it. And what they found, and this has been supported now by Russian research, is that the nutritive value isn't the main thing. And this is why they suggest that it works on some people so wonderfully well and on other people they can't tell a difference. And what it does is to provide the electrical energy. <coughs> like <coughs> if your back is low, so to speak, and then flow coming down the spine, this is what that is. It's a charge, and that's why if you take it, and you fit, you'll know right away if it works. All right. If you take it a week or two and it doesn't do anything, you don't need it because you got your own... Or you're not ready for it. Or you're not ready for it. You see, we, we talked about electrical energy. This is part of it. Of course, the universal mind will drop us our prana.